Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer A, B, or C. One. You hear a woman talking about the final episode of a TV series. We all knew that in the end, Sam the hero would win back the love of his girlfriend, Claire. I don't think there was much doubt about that. After all, series like this don't go in for unhappy endings. If they did, they wouldn't attract such large audiences. After weeks of drama and tears, we all wanted to leave the characters on a high note, and that's fair enough. But you'd have thought the scriptwriters would have produced a compelling last episode to do justice to what was up to that point a good series. But because most of the plot lines had resolved themselves the week before, it really wasn't worth watching. Now play the recording again. We all knew that in the end, Sam the hero would win back the love of his girlfriend, Claire. I don't think there was much doubt about that. After all, series like this don't go in for unhappy endings. If they did, they wouldn't attract such large audiences. After weeks of drama and tears, we all wanted to leave the characters on a high note, and that's fair enough. But you'd have thought the scriptwriters would have produced a compelling last episode to do justice to what was up to that point a good series. But because most of the plot lines had resolved themselves the week before, it really wasn't worth watching. Two, you hear a DJ who works in a club talking about his job. People normally request the big names from the DJ, but I've got a huge collection, so there isn't much I can't offer. Sometimes somebody comes up to me and requests a song that makes me say, "Yeah, that's an awesome track. I'll put that on right now." Sometimes it's something I don't particularly like, but it doesn't bother me because it's all part of the job, and I don't even mind playing old stuff because that adds variety. But what I can't stand is when someone requests a track and you have to tell them you've just played it. That does get to me, even if it's a band I really like. Now play the recording again. People normally request the big names from the DJ, but I've got a huge collection, so there isn't much I can't offer. Sometimes somebody comes up to me and requests a song that makes me say, "Yeah, that's an awesome track. I'll put that on right now." Sometimes it's something I don't particularly like, but it doesn't bother me because it's all part of the job, and I don't even mind playing old stuff because that adds variety. But what I can't stand is when someone requests a track and you have to tell them you've just played it. That does get to me, even if it's a band I really like. Three, you hear a man talking about an art exhibition. This is a collection of paintings from all over the world. There are four large rooms with paintings from the 17th to the 20th centuries. I wish they devoted one room to each century instead of grouping the paintings according to topic. I'd have found it more interesting. They were all landscapes by famous painters, and if you were interested, there was something about the artist and the actual place where they painted. I find that reading things about a painting distracts my attention, but I did buy a book about the exhibition on my way out. There were about one hundred paintings, which is impressive for a small gallery. Now play the recording again. This is a collection of paintings from all over the world. There are four large rooms with paintings from the 17th to the 20th centuries. I wish they devoted one room to each century instead of grouping the paintings according to topic. I'd have found it more interesting. 
They were all landscapes by famous painters, and if you were interested, there was something about the artist and the actual place where they painted. I find that reading things about a painting distracts my attention, but I did buy a book about the exhibition on my way out. There were about one hundred paintings, which is impressive for a small gallery. Four, you hear a radio announcement about a job vacancy. We've got a vacancy in our sales department, and we'd like a young person, ideally somebody just out of college. This job involves face-to-face -face contact with customers, and there'll be problems to solve for them. We're offering a full training in customer care, and the rest is learnt on the job. All you need is lots of enthusiasm, but of course we do need somebody who can produce a report in clear English, and we don't give any training in that. And just in case you're thinking perhaps you need to be good at maths, we have an accounts department that takes care of all that, so it's not an issue. Now play the recording again. We've got a vacancy in our sales department, and we'd like a young person, ideally somebody just out of college. This job involves face-to-face -face contact with customers, and there'll be problems to solve for them. We're offering a full training in customer care, and the rest is learnt on the job. All you need is lots of enthusiasm, but of course we do need somebody who can produce a report in clear English, and we don't give any training in that. And just in case you're thinking perhaps you need to be good at maths, we have an accounts department that takes care of all that, so it's not an issue. Five. You hear part of an interview with a restaurant owner. I opened the restaurant two weeks ago, and most days it's quite full. I was interviewed the other day for an article in Good Eating magazine, and that'll probably attract even more people. Well, it may be that your very good website is making people want to come and give you a try. I don't know if you designed it, but it's very attractive indeed. Actually, it was professionally done, though I'm sure you're right. My wife wasn't very keen on spending the money on it. She reckons satisfied customers tell their friends, and that's enough.、Mm, she may have a point, of course. You'll have to wait and see. Now play the recording again. I opened the restaurant two weeks ago, and most days it's quite full. I was interviewed the other day for an article in Good Eating magazine, and that'll probably attract even more people. Well, it may be that your very good website is making people want to come and give you a try. I don't know if you designed it, but it's very attractive indeed. Actually, it was professionally done, though I'm sure you're right. My wife wasn't very keen on spending the money on it. She reckons satisfied customers tell their friends, and that's enough.、Mm, she may have a point, of course. You'll have to wait and see. Six. You hear part of a talk by a young man who's just come back from a trip. This was partly a holiday and partly a study trip to see the places we'd studied in our geography lessons. I went with three friends from school, which was great because we organised the whole trip together and got on so well. I'd always travel with my family. And this experience has been so important in making me realise I can actually do things on my own. I speak good Spanish, so I was doing all the talking because neither of my friends know a word of it. But by the end of the trip, they'd learnt the basics and could more or less manage to make themselves understood. Now play the recording again. This was partly a holiday and partly a study trip to see the places we'd studied in our geography lessons. I went with three friends from school, which was great because we organised the whole trip together and got on so well. I'd always travel with my family, and this experience has been so important in making me realise I can actually do things on my own. I speak good Spanish, so I was doing all the talking because neither of my friends know a word of it. 
but by the end of the trip they'd learnt the basics and could more or less manage to make themselves understood. 7. On the radio you hear a sports journalist talking about an article she has written. There's a lot of talk nowadays about how children should be doing more sport and spending less time in front of the television or computer. Nobody doubts the fact that sport is good for your health, so I didn't feel it was necessary to deal with this in my article. My intention was to raise awareness of a key problem we need to address. We can't just say, go out and play a sport, without first investing more on sports venues. We need to look at how other countries deal with this problem, and also at what we can learn from the past. Now play the recording again. There's a lot of talk nowadays about how children should be doing more sport and spending less time in front of the television or computer. Nobody doubts the fact that sport is good for your health, so I didn't feel it was necessary to deal with this in my article. My intention was to raise awareness of a key problem we need to address. We can't just say, go out and play a sport, without first investing more on sports venues. We need to look at how other countries deal with this problem, and also at what we can learn from the past. 8. You hear a young man giving a talk about going camping. Camping is the best kind of holiday for me. I spend a lot of time planning each trip, so I can definitely give you some good advice. I believe in making sure I'll be warm and comfortable, so I take what some of my friends think is a completely unnecessary amount of clothing in case it gets cold or wet. Well, it's always worked for me, and I think they're crazy when I see the amount of food they take, which I wouldn't advise you to do, because it's always possible to find things locally. Wherever you're camping, there's always a village not too far away. 9. Now play the recording again. Camping is the best kind of holiday for me. I spend a lot of time planning each trip, so I can definitely give you some good advice. I believe in making sure I'll be warm and comfortable, so I take what some of my friends think is a completely unnecessary amount of clothing in case it gets cold or wet. Well, it's always worked for me, and I think they're crazy when I see the amount of food they take, which I wouldn't advise you to do, because it's always possible to find things locally. Wherever you're camping, there's always a village not too far away. 10. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a radio programme about the history of roller skating. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. In today's programme, I'm going to be talking about roller skating, how the sport started and how it has developed over the years. So who was the first person to come up with the idea of attaching wheels to the feet in order to get about more quickly and easily? Well, roller skates are not a new invention. In fact, roller skating developed out of the much older activity of ice skating, which has existed in Scandinavia and other northern countries for centuries. The actual inventor of the first roller skates is not known, but it's generally thought that they originated in Holland in the early 1700s. 
Roller skates first arrived in Britain in 1760, when the Belgian clockmaker John Merlin wore some to a formal ball in London. Merlin was known as something of a mad inventor, but he surprised everybody at the ball when he whizzed past them on wheels, playing the violin at the same time. Unfortunately, Merlin did not manage to persuade people that roller skating was a good idea. His skates had no brakes, and he ended up crashing into a large mirror. Merlin was quite seriously injured in the accident, and as a result, roller skating did not immediately become popular in Britain. In Germany, however, roller skates made a better impression. They were used in a ballet with the name Winter Pleasures, which included a scene where the dancers skated on ice. Because they couldn't produce the ice on stage, the organisers decided to use roller skates instead. After this, the sport gradually became more popular. But it was only thanks to technical advances that it became safer. In 1863, an American named James Plimpton solved the problem of controlling direction when skating by fitting them with rubber springs. His design is widely regarded as the origin of the modern roller skate, although rubber toe brakes, another important safety feature, didn't come in until the 1870s. The late 19th century saw the beginnings of events such as speed contests, artistic displays and roller dancing, as well as the first team sport on roller skates, roller hockey. During the first decades of the 20th century, hundreds of indoor and outdoor roller skating rinks opened, especially in the USA, and the sport became really established as a popular pastime. The first roller skating championships were held in Detroit in 1937. The real development of the modern roller skate only began in the second half of the 20th century. From the 1950s onwards, the use of plastics led to improvements in the design and performance of roller skates, and roller disco movies of the 1970s and 1980s increased the popularity of the sport, with roller discos opening in many parts of the world. Meanwhile, the stage musical Starlight Express, which features roller skating, ran for 17 years and was seen by 8 million people. The sport of roller skating has also been gaining a more serious following, especially in southern Europe and South America. The biggest modern change to roller skates came in 1983 with the introduction of inline skates, also known as rollerblades. Then, during the 1990s, New materials, brakes and boot fastenings all combined to make skates both lighter and safer than they had ever been in the past. So why is roller skating so popular? I went to talk to some fans at a rink in Huddersfield. Now play the recording again. In today's programme, I'm going to be talking about roller skating how the sport started, and how it has developed over the years. So, who was the first person to come up with the idea of attaching wheels to the feet in order to get about more quickly and easily? Well, roller skates are not a new invention. In fact, roller skating developed out of the much older activity of ice skating, which has existed in Scandinavia and other northern countries for centuries. The actual inventor of the first roller skates is not known, but it's generally thought that they originated in Holland in the early 1700s. Roller skates first arrived in Britain in 1760, when the Belgian clockmaker John Merlin wore some to a formal ball in London. Merlin was known as something of a mad inventor, but he surprised everybody at the ball when he whizzed past them on wheels, playing the violin at the same time. Unfortunately, Merlin did not manage to persuade people that roller skating was a good idea, his skates had no brakes, and he ended up crashing into a large mirror. Merlin was quite seriously injured in the accident, and as a result, roller skating did not immediately become popular in Britain. In Germany, however, roller skates made a better impression. They were used in a ballet with the name Winter Pleasures, which included a scene where the dancers skated on ice. Because they couldn't produce the ice on stage, the organisers decided to use roller skates instead. After this, the sport gradually became more popular. But it was only thanks to technical advances that it became safer. In 1863, an American named James Plimpton solved the problem of controlling direction when skating by fitting them with rubber springs. 
His design is widely regarded as the origin of the modern roller skate, although rubber toe brakes, another important safety feature, didn't come in until the 1870s. The late 19th century saw the beginnings of events such as speed contests, artistic displays and roller dancing, as well as the first team sport on roller skates, roller hockey. During the first decades of the 20th century, hundreds of indoor and outdoor roller skating rinks opened, especially in the USA, and the sport became really established as a popular pastime. The first roller skating championships were held in Detroit in 1937. The real development of the modern roller skate only began in the second half of the 20th century. From the 1950s onwards, the use of plastics led to improvements in the design and performance of roller skates, and roller disco movies of the 1970s and 1980s increased the popularity of the sport, with roller discos opening in many parts of the world. Meanwhile, the stage musical Starlight Express, which features roller skating, ran for 17 years and was seen by 8 million people. The sport of roller skating has also been gaining a more serious following, especially in southern Europe and South America. The biggest modern change to roller skates came in 1983 with the introduction of inline skates, also known as rollerblades. Then, during the 1990s, new materials, brakes and boot fastenings all combined to make skates both lighter and safer than they had ever been in the past. So why is roller skating so popular? I went to talk to some fans at a rink in Huddersfield. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five different students talking about their first year at university. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to F what each student says. Use each letter only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker 1. I decided to study history. I want to be a lecturer one day. When you want to do a degree, say in pharmacy, there's little difference in content between universities, I think. But history at one university can be very different to history at another, so I had to do some research about the three colleges where I might have wanted to study. I'd heard good things about Dundee University, and they all prove correct. I'm from Ireland and I got to study Irish history plus a focus on the European Union. I've been so busy I've had no time to enjoy student parties, but that'll come, I'm sure. Speaker 2 I'd always thought I wanted to study medicine, but the college I wanted to go to only had 20 places and I didn't get a place. That was disappointing, and I even thought I might take a year out. But then I had second thoughts about my choice of subject and went for nursing. I'm now at Sheffield Hallam College, which is linked to a variety of hospitals and isn't too far away from home, though far enough for me to be independent. People who'd gone there told me it was really good and the tutors had time for you, the course is brilliant, and there's a friendly campus atmosphere. Speaker 3 I'm studying for a degree in French at Sussex University. It's a part-time course. Very few students would want to study part-time for a first degree, of course. Part-time study is mainly for people like me who have other responsibilities. I work mornings in a school, and I'm keen to keep it that way. I'm learning a lot, though it's been different to what I expected. I thought it was going to be easier. Unlike me, full-time students live in accommodation on the campus. 
and I hear wonderful stories about the great parties they organise. They say I don't know what I'm missing, but I don't mind really. Speaker four. Psychology was always my choice of degree subject. I studied it at school and soon realised it was what I wanted to do at university. My parents tried hard but failed to make me change my mind. They said I was making the wrong choice and that I wouldn't be able to make a living. But I love it. I'm interested in social psychology, how people interact. It's fascinating, and I know I'll be able to find work easily. I'm at Coventry University, living in student accommodation, which is very convenient. Coventry is really student oriented, and the teachers are very friendly. And my brother lives only twenty minutes away, so I see him often. Speaker five. I'm studying geography at Swansea University because I love this area. I came the first day thinking, what if I find out the course isn't what I wanted? But it's amazing. The department is really good, and what really does it for me is that it's been brilliant in other ways. Pretty much every weekend, there's a chance for students to go out. There's a group of us who knew each other from school, and we're all starting together. I'm still living at home, but I hope to be able to do some part-time work and rent a small flat with a couple of friends next year. Now play the recording again. Speaker one. I decided to study history. I want to be a lecturer one day. When you want to do a degree, say in pharmacy, there's little difference in content between universities. I think, but history at one university can be very different to history at another. So I had to do some research about the three colleges where I might have wanted to study. I'd heard good things about Dundee University, and they all prove correct. I'm from Ireland, and I got to study Irish history plus a focus on the European Union. I've been so busy, I've had no time to enjoy student parties, but that'll come, I'm sure. Speaker two. I'd always thought I wanted to study medicine, but the college I wanted to go to only had twenty places. And I didn't get a place. That was disappointing, and I even thought I might take a year out. But then I had second thoughts about my choice of subject, and went for nursing. I'm now at Sheffield Hallam College, which is linked to a variety of hospitals and isn't too far away from home, though far enough for me to be independent. People who'd gone there told me it was really good. And the tutors had time for you. The course is brilliant, and there's a friendly campus atmosphere. Speaker three. I'm studying for a degree in French at Sussex University. It's a part-time course. Very few students would want to study part-time for a first degree, of course. Part-time study is mainly for people like me who have other responsibilities. I work mornings in a school, and I'm keen to keep it that way. I'm learning a lot, though it's been different to what I expected. I thought it was going to be easier. Unlike me, full-time students live in accommodation on the campus, and I hear wonderful stories about the great parties they organise. They say I don't know what I'm missing, but I don't mind really. Speaker four. Psychology was always my choice of degree subject. I studied it at school and soon realised it was what I wanted to do at university. My parents tried hard but failed to make me change my mind. They said I was making the wrong choice and that I wouldn't be able to make a living. But I love it. I'm interested in social psychology, how people interact. It's fascinating, and I know I'll be able to find work easily. I'm at Coventry University, living in student accommodation, which is very convenient. Coventry is really student oriented, and the teachers are very friendly. And my brother lives only twenty minutes away, so I see him often. Speaker five. 
I'm studying geography at Swansea University because I love this area. I came the first day thinking, what if I find out the course isn't what I wanted? But it's amazing. The department is really good. And what really does it for me is that it's been brilliant in other ways. Pretty much every weekend there's a chance for students to go out. There's a group of us who knew each other from school and we're all starting together. I'm still living at home, but I hope to be able to do some part-time work and rent a small flat with a couple of friends next year. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with the film actor Mikey Standish. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. With us today is the actor Mikey Standish. Mikey, with your career on the up, do you want to be the next Leonardo DiCaprio? <laughs> I don't really try to be anyone else. I know that's what is said about me, and it upsets me because I'm just trying to experience as many different types and styles of acting as I can. So it's not fair. I've managed to play a wide range of roles, the cinema industry usually wants to see you doing the same thing all the time, but I prefer to stretch myself. In your latest film, The Waterfall, you play Simon, a young man very much like yourself. <laughs> yeah, um, I thought it was going to be easy because it's closer to me. I'd been in full-time education for 20 years, like Simon has. Simon's middle class, I'm middle class, etc., etc. So I understood where the guy was coming from. But actually, that made it kind of frightening, because if you're not careful, there's no character to hide behind, if you know what I mean. But doing it has certainly made me into a better actor. Are there any character types that you would prefer not to play? Yeah. I once played this man who was a real waste of time. We've seen that so often. The unworthy, totally uninteresting person who then turns out to have the answer to everything. I want no part in that. I don't mind continuing to play the romantic lead, but the character must develop in a way that's believable. How old were you when you decided that acting was something that you wanted to do? I applied for drama college before I decided that acting was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was offered a film when I was 16, and I did it. I got that part just out of the blue with a French director, and then I didn't act for two years. I worked in a bakery and tried to get on at school, but I wasn't doing too well. So it was either leave school and stay in the bakery, which was out of the question really, or try drama school, because I'd done this one film and I might get in. And what would you tell the kids who are interested or thinking about acting as a career? I think drama school is the best thing. It's the environment where you realise whether you want to do it or not. You're competitive all the time in the real world, and this competitive element can make you carry on, though the job might be something you're not suited to, or something that you maybe don't even like. But the competition can keep you going, and that's not good. It's not healthy. How do you cope with being a celebrity? I'm lucky. I've been doing this work for seven years now, so it's not like happened overnight. Over the last few years, I've been getting recognised on the street more and more often, as the press coverage has increased, but I can handle it okay. 
Had it been like, bang, suddenly you're a star and your life's not your own anymore, who knows, I might not have coped so well. So, what's your next movie? I'll do something I have always wanted to do, which is a sci-fi movie. It's not starting till next year. And I've had some calls from a director asking if I could fit in another movie in the meantime. It was a very tempting offer, which would have involved me in actually producing the script as well. But the truth is that I've done five films without much of a break, so I'm definitely in need of a bit of time off. As from tomorrow, actually. <laughs> right. Mikey Standish, thank you, and I hope you enjoy your break. Now play the recording again. With us today is the actor Mikey Standish. Mikey, with your career on the up, do you want to be the next Leonardo DiCaprio? <laughs> I don't really try to be anyone else. I know that's what is said about me, and it upsets me because I'm just trying to experience as many different types and styles of acting as I can. So it's not fair. I've managed to play a wide range of roles. The cinema industry usually wants to see you doing the same thing all the time, but I prefer to stretch myself. In your latest film, The Waterfall, you play Simon, a young man very much like yourself. <laughs> yeah, um, I thought it was going to be easy because it's closer to me. I'd been in full-time education for 20 years, like Simon has. Simon's middle class, I'm middle class, etc., etc. So I understood where the guy was coming from. But actually, that made it kind of frightening, because if you're not careful, there's no character to hide behind, if you know what I mean. But doing it has certainly made me into a better actor. Are there any character types that you would prefer not to play? Yeah. I once played this man who was a real waste of time. We've seen that so often. The unworthy, totally uninteresting person who then turns out to have the answer to everything. I want no part in that. I don't mind continuing to play the romantic lead, but the character must develop in a way that's believable. How old were you when you decided that acting was something that you wanted to do? I applied for drama college before I decided that acting was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was offered a film when I was 16, and I did it. I got that part just out of the blue with a French director, and then I didn't act for two years. I worked in a bakery and tried to get on at school, but I wasn't doing too well. So it was either leave school and stay in the bakery, which was out of the question really, or try drama school because I'd done this one film and I might get in. And what would you tell the kids who are interested or thinking about acting as a career? I think drama school is the best thing. It's the environment where you realise whether you want to do it or not. You're competitive all the time in the real world, and this competitive element can make you carry on, though the job might be something you're not suited to, or something that you maybe don't even like. But the competition can keep you going, and that's not good. It's not healthy. How do you cope with being a celebrity? I'm lucky. I've been doing this work for seven years now, so it's not like happened overnight. Over the last few years, I've been getting recognised on the street more and more often as the press coverage has increased, but I can handle it OK. Had it been like, bang, suddenly you're a star and your life's not your own anymore, who knows, I might not have coped so well. So, what's your next movie? I'll do something I have always wanted to do, which is a sci-fi movie. It's not starting till next year, and I've had some calls from a director asking if I could fit in another movie in the meantime. It was a very tempting offer, which would have involved me in actually producing the script as well. But the truth is that I've done five films without much of a break, so I'm definitely in need of a bit of time off. As from tomorrow, actually. <laughs> right. Mikey Standish, thank you, and I hope you enjoy your break.